hear me okay now? Good. Um, thank you, Melissa. And I want to thank the Culture Conservancy for arranging this forum. And also, it's, more, it's all, always important to thank all of our ancestors, especially those people that developed those amazing foods that Lois just told us about. So for the last 30 years, I spent a lot of time with indigenous people and indigenous communities around the world, and especially with, with my own community. I'm an Aramuri. Some people call us Tarahumara, but I've spent a lot of time with people in the Southwest and throughout Mexico, in New Zealand, in Northern Australia, in Ethiopia. And most of the time we just talk when I'm working with folks and hanging out. We work in their fields. Uh, we engage in ceremony. We tell stories. And during all that time, I've come to understand some fundamental similarities among indigenous peoples from all over the place. You know, we often ate. <laughs> but we didn't just eat anything. <laughs> we would. We often would eat foods that our people have been eating for hundreds, sometimes thousands of years. And these are foods that we raised, we gathered, and hunted and caught in the ocean. Foods that we've shared the same breath of life with. The breath of life that is imbued in that, those lands that we all come from and in places that we think of as home. To us, they're the center of the universe. There are places of emergence. And for indigenous people, ancestral foods and how we, and when we eat them are reflections of one of the things we hold most dear, our places, our homelands, those places that we hold most sacred, these various kinds of landscapes. And when we eat foods that are born of those lands, we're engaging in an act of eating our landscape and eating our belief systems, our worldviews. Still today, I think, when a Lakota bites into a buffalo steak, this is an act of mental activation of things that have been held most sacred to Lakota and other Plains Indians for hundreds of years. When a Hopi eats suminiki, which is this tamale-like dish made of corn, that person's mind activates culturally held memories of emergence, migration, and first corn. Similarly, when a Haida is ready to eat some freshly caught salmon, hundreds of years of memories of salmon fishing, potlatch, and cedar dances are touched upon and connected with. Our foods are more than nourishment. They are markers of identity. An identity interwoven with landscapes and culturally symbolic events that occurred on those lands. These are lands that spiritually feed our hearts through the cultural arteries and ventricles of story, ritual, history, and of course, foods. So what I want to do now is I want to read some short sections out of my book. I don't have a PowerPoint or anything like that. I just want to read and tell you some, some stories. And I'm hoping that uh, to reveal some deeper understanding of these concepts that are obvious, logical, and also very, very multi-layered. It's not something we can understand and learn in, in just one reading or even one class that I teach at Cal State East Bay. So afterwards, there'll be time for some questions. But I want to start with my family. Food was an essential ingredient in all of our family gatherings. It blended with music, teasing, laughter, stories, and dancing to create a delicious, pungent celebration. Our celebrations were sometimes planned, but more often impromptu events, spurred by a cousin getting a new job, dad getting a raise, a family member having just returned from being gone for a length of time. Once it was decided that a celebration was ordered, someone 
would soon ask, what are we going to eat? Sometimes the food itself was the cause for celebration. Every now and then, my Aunt Nick would bring over a bag of freshly picked avocados. And to this day, I don't know where they came from or how she came to get the avocados, but she would just show up with a plain paper bag full of about 20 avocados ready to transform into guacamole or simply just slice and eat with salt and pepper and salsa. Aunt Nick never knocked when she came into our little house. She would just enter and put the bag of avocados on the nearest flat surface and she roughly would greet my mom or me. And it was assumed by everyone that the fruits would be made into something to eat on the spot. Magically, and within 20 minutes, a feast was set before us and we were eating. It was a requirement that there was always something to eat in our home, even if it was just tortillas or beans. Our family gatherings were in our loving and soulful times. Food, especially foods made by the hands of the people present, added to the soulful and loving feelings inherent in this space. Every day our food included tortillas, beans, and some kind of burrito or taco. We didn't know that fajitas would someday become this specialized hot cuisine that would cost a lot of money just to get in downtown Los Angeles or San Francisco. My mom's tortillas were always near perfect circles. They were soft and pliable and smelled best when returning home from a long day of being outside with my cousins. I could smell the aroma while still outside, letting my bicycle crash to the ground, entering the house. I would inhale deeply in order to gloriously embrace the warmth of, of corn and flour masa being heated, pinto beans steaming on the stove, and, and a flimsy pile of newly cooked tortillas on a table behind where my mom stood by the oven. I enjoyed the fresh tortillas most with melted butter rolled up inside the hot circle. They also tasted great with a simple bowl of pinto beans swimming in the juices ladled into the bowl directly from the pot. Cooking pinto beans was both a simple and complex affair. I never ate canned beans. Not until I left home, and they were always unsatisfactory. Pinto beans prepared from scratch required only the hard, uncooked beans. They were always spread out on a table and sifted through for stones, dirt clods, and those wrinkled beans that appeared as though they had shriveled up in the sun. Then they were prepared with pig's feet or salt pork, lard, epazote, and other secret spices. A pot of beans was more like a stew than a simple dish. Foods that require extra process before preparation such as beans and corn and whole grains provide both, both a brush of the texture and color to meal preparation and further community involvement in their process from harvest to meal. When helping my mom sort the hidden stones from the beans, I used to place a single shiny bean inside my mouth and flick it with my tongue in order to balance it against the insides of my teeth. It would drive her crazy. I sometimes wondered whether a plant would begin to sprout inside of my body if I did that long enough or if I accidentally swallowed the bean. My mom used to warn me that the beans were dirty and worried that I would get sick. I figured that I swallowed so many germs already in my daily activities as a kid that one semi-dirty bean wouldn't cause any more harm. I knew where the beans had come from. In some cases, I'd help collect beans from the semi-dried encasements hanging from their stalks. What you looking for? Looking for a cell phone. Got a call? OK. <laughs> This kind of tactile knowledge contributed to my overall library of food-related knowledge. Strangely, I would not be able to identify the source of most of my food understanding from my childhood. I simply knew it. It has become a part of the volumes of library of a traditional knowledge encoded in the language of my family's experiences and attitude during later interactions with land-based indigenous people. Of course, we ate our family version of tacos, tostadas, burritos, and other northern Mexican cuisine. 
but it would be difficult to compare our version of these dishes to those in a typical Mexican restaurant. This is because the preparation and ingredients associated with these foods reflected our unique collective family history and experiences, especially those connected to landscapes. When the occasion was more than impromptu, the king and queen of celebration foods emerged, carne asada and tamales. Carne asada, beef strips marinated in various blends of spices, citrus juices, and herbs would cause my first cousin's mouth to water, as various mentioned. Beer was an essential accompaniment with carne asada. That's another story. We would drive miles out of our way to find the very best carne asada, either pre-prepared and brought home in plastic bags while still marinating, or cooked and speedily couriered by a relative to the party location. It was best cooked outside over a barbecue and eaten with tortillas and lime. Tamales arrived on a plate in front of the eater in a variety of incarnations depending on which member of the family had supervised the preparation. One could identify the maker by the signature ingredients, softness of the corn masa, and amount of filling. One never dared mention a preference of tamales in public for fear of some kind of familiar retribution because besides, they were all good. And recipes were often amalgams of several current and past family recipes. Still, there, were, there was this underlying competition surrounding tamales that was pursued by the tamale chefs in the family. In our case, it included most of the married women. Although they all preached the beauty and love associated with the fact that the important thing was that we all had enough to eat, I recall watching my various aunts, Aina's, as we ate their tamales. They paid attention to the ephemeral qualities of the gusto we poured into or tamale eating. They secretly counted how many of their or their sister's tamales we ate and noted whether we made comments or other such eating-related noises. I never told anyone, especially my mom, but I really enjoyed most the tamales made by her best friend, Eloisa. Sounds like some of you guys know what I'm going through here. <laughs> she wasn't a blood relative and became a friend of my mom's when I was very young after having moved into Eloisa's neighborhood. Eloisa's tamales were always moist and could be counted on to contain a hefty, spicy pork filling offset by the unusual inclusion of raisins. The raisins were unique and special. I can still recall the first time I bit into her tamales. At first, my mouth was surprised at the squirt of raisin juice among the familiar spices and textures. Quickly, I realized the ingredient and have searched for this kind of tamale ever since, but I've never found the exact kind. People have tried. Tamale making parties always preceded the actual celebration. The female members of the family would gather, drink margaritas, laugh, make sort of remarks about the men in the family and simply have fun. By the, end, by the end of the tamale making fiesta, the laughter was loud and raucous. I enjoyed watching my mother during these times as she opened up and became more loving than her normal self, which was especially loving to begin with. At celebrations where tamales were served, we searched for the tamales that were made at the end of the tamale making party. We could distinguish them by their fatness. <laughs> Recipes were shared during celebrations whenever family came together. They're a form of knowledge reproduction and social exchange. They gave everyone something to talk and gossip about, to share and be proud of. Without the sharing of recipes, the family community begins to dissolve. The tamale making parties have vanished from our family. No one has time to spend preparing the masa and the get together. Anniversaries and weddings, have to be planned now a year in advance. Invitations are sent out as far as in, in advance of the celebration as possible in order for family members to make time in their calendars. Today, in many neighborhoods where there is a huge Hispanic community nearby, couples walk the street holding between them a large pressure cooker 
or ice chest filled with tamales. They arrive at the front doors of strangers' homes, selling the contents of their burden in order to make ends meet. Once was, what was once a celebration food has become a source of supplementary income. I've eaten my share of tamales, but I have no idea today who made them and under what circumstances. Perhaps laughter accompanied the making. I would hope so. Nevertheless, these tamales do not connect me to a community. My identity and culture as a Mexican Indian is reaffirmed whenever I eat tamales, but not the unique community with whom I grew up and from where my understanding of my identity is connected to a landscape and from where it emerged. My reaffirmation of identity and connection to place is not a direct result of the tamales, but comes more from the process that surround tamales, beans, raisins, and cited tamales, and my grandmother's herbal teas. The process these interconnect family, landscape, collection knowledge, story, and an encoded library of cultural and ecological knowledge, all of which sustain and revitalize a sense of self and place. A statistics I read on the back of, of a milk carton one morning revealed that people who eat so many meals with their families suffered less from crimes and other social ills. This milk carton morality reflects, I feel, the consequences of modern society that is removed from a direct relationship to its food and from social processes related to eating any landscape. Eating a landscape is more than an act of eating. Eating a landscape is also a social reaffirming act. In the case of my family, whenever I partake of Eloisa's tamale recipe or my mother's way of preparing salsa, I'm eating the memories and knowledge associated with those foods. The elements of the stories, the jokes, and the intricate contextualized experience become embodied every time the eating takes place becomes a form of medic regeneration to eat one's family's recipes. Eating is a cultural act that reaffirms one identi one's identity and worldview each time one sits down to a plate of home-cooked beans or sopa de albondigas. Culture is performed by humans every minute of every day. Eating our culture and our familial memories is another ritual that is performed throughout our lives. How we remember our lines for this ongoing stage act happens each time we prepare to do something cultural, such as eating old family recipes. In other words, we often eat our family and our culture. I'm not a cannibal, by the way. I'm going to move now to something associated with this. The act of native agriculture involves much more than knowing when to plow, how to irrigate, and what depth to sow seed. The responsibility of growing food for one's community is connected to one's identity as a member of the community. This identity, this sense of beingness, is tied to the history of the people on a landscape. The very essence of being Okeawenge, for example, San Juan Pueblo, means that one's being is connected to the mountains that house the land in which the community survives. One's blood flows because the rivers and streams that flow across this landscape eventually feed the food that one eats. There is a consciousness that one exists because others came before who reaped this land and that others before them emerged from this very land, water and air with which one still comes in contact. Raising an ear of corn in this context is a metaphor for helping the children of the community grow and survive. Farming is a performance art that reflects one's relationship to place the cosmos in the community. If young people are only dancing that we see today among a lot of indigenous communities, but no longer farming, and the behavior is akin to making tortillas without flour or corn masa. The most important ingredients are missing.
So I want to skip to another section here. I want to go over to northern New Mexico, or excuse me, northern Arizona. Let's cut out. Where's our tech person? <laughs> Hello? There we go. He came back. Thank you. Okay, no, now it keeps, there we go, all right. <laughs> it might be me hitting this thing here, okay. So I wanna to go to Northern Arizona. Who's ever been up there, across the Navajo Reservation? All right, it's very green and lush, isn't it? No? Nope. <laughs> this story comes from there. There's nothing out there, she said. One of my students from the East Coast was leaning her head against the warm window of the 15-passenger van as we traversed the Navajo Reservation in northern Arizona. She also wondered out loud how anyone could have survived in this place. I believe that she was equally concerned about how she and her fellow students would survive should the group experience some misfortune. From most vantage points, the Colorado Plateau appears dry and desolate and we were on our way to spend two weeks in the field for an ethnobotany field school. At first glance, the students' concern and wonder seem appropriate. The landscape appears very much like the scenes of desolate landscapes marked by sandstone cliffs, showcased in innumerable Hollywood movies and in nature programs. However, unlike the fantasies encouraged by Hollywood, the Colorado Plateau of nor northern Arizona and southernmost segment of Utah the southwest corner of Colorado and the northwest, northwest portion of New Mexico is an incredible array of biocultural diversity stewarded today by resilient native farmers, young native activists, and dedicated individuals that think of this place as home. On the surface of things, water is scarce as the vegetation, although large, uh, huge aquifers lie underneath most of the plateau during normal years, the land receives less than 10 inches of precipitation annually, and this comes in a bimodal pattern, meaning it comes in torrents during the summer monsoon season, then washes temporarily become rivers, and once dusty washboarded roads transform into red-brown mud bogs. The other rainy period is during the winter when the female rain comes as Navajo people referred to it, softly touching the thirsty land. Today, due to the climate shifts, the plateau is even drier. Somehow, despite the aridity, peoples have flourished and continue to flourish on this landscape. Over 10,000 years ago, Paleo-Indians, as anthropologists call these early ancestors, began to hunt and camp and gather in the area. They camped around springs and followed a few watercourses, leaving their mark as chiseled and painted art on cliffs and large boulders. Later, beginning about 8,000 years ago, some people began to cultivate crops and were settling on the land, again in locations where water was present. By the time the first Spanish conquistadors were scattered in the region for possible gold in 1540, the Colorado Plateau became a cultural and linguistic hotspot. Seven linguistic families were present on the plateau. I mean, people like Navajo, Hopi, the Pai, Southern Paiute, Zuni, Karizan, Tewa, Toa, Apache, and Newt. The, reason, the region has significance for ling linguistic diversity as well as be a beacon for American Indian linguistic survival. My students and I managed to experience a Colorado plateau much as Abby suggested. If you ever read any Edward Abbey, he tells us to get down on your hands and knees and taste the desert. After two weeks of camping on the sandy red soils, getting it in our food and in our eyes, and crushing sagebrush leaves between their fingers in order to inhale the pungent scent, the students were sad that our trip was over. There exists a diversity of biota and her heterogeneity on the plateau that cannot be seen through a van window. Such can be experienced only by walking across 
a Hopi mesa, where fissures on the tabletop reveal microclimates of lichen, flowers, and herbs fed by the tiniest rivulets of water. Or it could be found when one climbs the eight miles from the Havasupai community of Supai to the rim of the Grand Canyon. <coughs> Along the way, the eye adjusts to the changes in hues of soil, while the air, ear listens first to the descending whistle of the canyon wren. And then, by the time the rim is reached, the song shifts to the screech of the pinyon jay. Native farmers pray and dance for life to sprout from the dry soils of the Colorado Plateau. It was not only the individual farmers whose fields introduced seasonal green mosaics to the reddish hues of the plateau. The agriculturalists were and remain supported by weaves of community and spiritual relationships that reach deeper than the tiniest, the thirstiest juniper roots. These collaborations between human community, the land, the rain, and the skies develop at their significant commitments to make each other's conditions for life the same. Resilient communities on the Colorado Plateau emerged only after they became interdependent and interrelated with each other and with their surroundings. These types of communities are inclusive, reaching toward all the diversity that they share. They share a willingness to coexist with nature, much like that of a marriage between people that requires a stick to itiveness in order for the bond to be lasting. The bonds that have held the Hopi, Navajo, Zuni, Apache, and Paiute to this land gain strength only after long stretches of time. During recent times, however, those bonds have been weakened, leading some to seek innovative measures for maintaining their connections to land and culture. Many at the forefront of this battle have been elderly. They are the segments of traditional communities that maintain the cultural memories central for short-term innovation to base its foundation on innovative change and cultural revitalization. And then finally, I want to switch to a whole different topic now. Who's ever been to Vermont? A little greener than, than uh, the Colorado Plateau of Arizona, isn't it? So let's go over there for a second. The mosaic of green that carpets the Mad River Valley in west central Vermont peeks through the shifting layers of clouds and fog drifting below. I was slowly walking downhill toward the large red barn that is a combination meeting place, dining area, and working space for Knoll Farm, a 450-acre working farm run by Peter Forbes and his wife, Helen Rydra. No Farm is also the headquarters for the Center for Whole Communities. Peter, Helen, and a dedicated staff manage the farm and center for the purpose of hosting environmental and social justice leaders at week-long retreats at which the participants meditate and engage in whole thinking dialogue. People are nominated by past alum and travel from across the country to stay in small tents, cabin tents and yurts situated among the mixed eastern deciduous forest on a steep shelf that crosses along the upper part of the property. Everyone has to head downhill toward the barn for breakfast. It was there, I was there, to act as a, a sort of what they call yeast, to ensure that questions and other inputs into the dialogue remained alive and flowing. I had done this the previous summer as, as a result of being asked to nominate participants for this summer. I had nominated both Miguel San Esteban and Paula Garcia. At the time, Miguel was a program coordinator for the New Mexico Sequia Association, directed by Paula Garcia, and Paula couldn't make it. But Miguel happily, excitedly made his way to Vermont's Mad River Valley. It was the first full day of the retreat. I had headed toward the barn, taking in the green, fluffy, white show below me. I saw Miguel emerge from his tent downhill about 60 yards ahead of me. He crawled out of the low entrance and was in the process of standing up. He never reached his full height. 
During the middle of rising, he looked below at the valley, peeking through the clouds. I looked, out, I looked on as he stopped in a crouch, his arms open to his sides. His back was to me, but it was obvious by his gestures that he couldn't believe what the river valley and clouds were revealing to him. He crouched even lower and then turned his entire body to his left, to his right, stopping each time to face the valley below as if to make sure the scene was still there. He repeated this impromptu dance several times and then stopped when he noticed me walking through toward him from above. Mornings at Noel Farm are taken in silence until 10 a.m. Therefore, Miguel could only smile at me as I walked by. I smirked, gave him a knowing glance, and continued downhill through the tall grass towards the barn. Later, I asked Miguel what his dance was all about. Several other retreat members were hanging around, all ready to eager to hear another one of Miguel's fantastical stories. Never wanted to miss an opportunity to be the center of attention and to mix storytelling with lessons, Miguel explained in his low, gurgling voice, tinged with a New Mexican Chicano accent, I'm a dry land farmer. I raise corn and beans in the desert. I pray for rain and dig ditches so that the water from the river can travel to my fields. To wake up and to see so much green and moisture is like a miracle. Just look at, this took place in front of me. I had to acknowledge that and dance. Miguel's description of how he and others like him farmed the arid region of northern New Mexico was reflective of how Hispanos, the native peoples before them, coaxed food from the landscape. And there we go. Finally, human existence is imbued with plants, land, and water. A large part of the story of Hispanos in the Rio Arriba in northern New Mexico includes the same. Hispanos social organization, spirituality, and aesthetics are associated with water that flows through the dry lands that nurtures their crops and consciousness. Since 1681, when the Wicopilacion de los Leyes de los Reinos de los Indias, the laws of the Indies, were published and distributed throughout the New World, Hispano consciousness has been imbued with their landscape. The laws in Book 4, Title 7, Law 7, ordered that land and surroundings were to be settled for the most fertile, with abundant pasture, firewood, Lumber, materials, sweet waters, natural people, transportation, ingress and egress, and there be no lake close by, no marshlands where venomous animals live, nor there be any corruption of wind or waters. According to Juan Esteban Ariano, this and two other laws laid the cornerstones, the foundation of what has become what he calls Hispano Querencia, that which affords his people a sense of place. Cadencia is also simply the love of the love for the land and place. But it is a much more complex concept that is based on a number of cognitive models unique to Hispano cognition along the Rio Arriba. The models include notions of landscape, language, cultural memory, and identity. The environment is not a thing for Hispanos, but as a part of their identity, because their memories encoded in their languages, songs, ritual, stories, and cultural history are linked to their place. Those are some of my ideas that I hope that you got something fun. <laughs> Thank you.